let me introduce uh, Dr. Egan. Dr. Egan is an anesthesiologist and a professor and chair in the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Utah School of Medicine. Um, Dr. Egan is also an adjunct professor to the Departments of Pharmaceutics, Bioengineering. That's plenty. That's plenty. <laughs> okay, so. We're a little behind. <laughs> okay, great. So um, today, Dr. Egan is going to share with us his uh, perspective on the drug titration paradox. Uh, which is a phenomenon that has attracted a lot of attention even beyond the, the boundaries of our own profession, I would say. So, Dr. Egan, go ahead. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and, and sorry to interrupt, but um, these are all my friends, and so and no need to, uh, to, to give a lengthy introduction. Um, I want to begin by uh, just pausing for a moment and, uh, and remember uh, Dr. Naguib. This is a, a lecture in his honor, and he was a key contributor to ISAP and was a good friend of ours and uh, was a terrific clinician scientist and a wonderful humanitarian, and we miss him a lot. And so I want to just say what a privilege and honor it is for me to be uh, speaking uh, at this lecture named in his honor. I also want to quickly mention uh, disclosures uh, my disclosures are as noted in the meeting brochure, none of which is particularly relevant to this presentation today. So I've entitled this to Drug Titration Paradox, Something Obvious Finally Understood. And as you know, I come to you from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. This is a picture of our health science campus nestled uh, at the foot of the beautiful Wasatch Mountains. You should all be jealous. Now, I want to just quickly give you an outline. I want to reflect on the rarity of new concepts, new clinical pharmacology concepts in anesthesiology. I want to consider titration as the primary method of getting the dose right. This is something we refer to, at least I like to call, posology. I want to introduce the drug titration paradise, uh, not paradise, paradox concept. And then I'd like to explore the evidence supporting the reality of this concept. Uh, in, in both populations and, and briefly about individuals. And then I'll, I'll speak very briefly about the research implications of the drug titration paradox. So my overall goal, goal is to explore the titration paradox as a new concept, an emerging concept in anesthesia-related clinical pharmacology. I want to just call attention to a, a one piece of the very small uh, literature that's accumulating on this. Uh, that has the same title as my remarks today because many of the concepts and one of the figures I'm going to show, and most importantly, the, the relevant citations you'll find in this editorial. So you might find that that's a useful uh, way to continue your exploration of this idea. Okay, to begin, new clinical pharmacology concepts arise very infrequently in anesthesiology. And so I want to take a walk down memory lane for a moment and identify what I think are among the most important clinical pharmacology concepts, ideas, and in some cases, technologies in anesthesiology. And I'm going to have to apologize to uh, our, our eminent guest uh, or uh, ISAP member, Dr. Evan Karish, because I'm going to take a little creative license with the covers of the anesthesia journals. I wanna just emphasize, these are all made up. They don't exist in real life. But I want you to sort of think with me, if you were gonna create a cover about these ideas, what might it have looked like? One of the problems, of course, is that when a new idea is published, they don't usually get a cover story, right? Because it's not clear that it's going to emerge as an important uh, advance. And so uh, think about what you might have done if you were the art director for the covers of these journals. You're gonna notice that I've put a syringe in all of them because although we call ourselves ISAP, Anesthesia Pharmacology, we really began as sort of a TIVA organization. So that's where our, our heart and soul really is. Okay, well, again, this is the world according to Talmadge. These are the most important clinical pharmacology ideas from my perspective. So the, the, the first, of course, is MAC. I think it's the most unifying concept in anesthesia, and uh, it, 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 it sort of ties so many other things together. 
I think the second most important concept in anesthesia is the reduction of MAC, mostly by opioids, but also by some other drugs, because this is really the workhorse of the modern anesthetic. We reduce MAC and, and thereby create some advantages uh, over just using one drug, one inhalation agent. Okay, the effect site, another really important advance. This was a revolutionary advance in pharmacodynamic modeling because it made it so that we could actually relate drug concentration to effect, and it, it dealt with the hysteresis, which we've just been talking about today. So another really important advance. It also made it possible to create concentration effect relationships with non-steady state experiments. You could do a brief infusion and still uh, estimate the concentration effect relationship. The context-sensitive halftime, another revolutionary advance in pharmacokinetic understanding that sort of came out of Stanford and, and Duke. Uh, Steve Schaefer really developed the, the concept and then it was explored further by the group at Duke uh, and they are the ones that gave it a name. I think model adjustment for covariate effects, that is the ability to, to incorporate into our models the effects of age, for example, body weight, uh, is another important idea that uh, has impacted our practice quite a bit. The fact that we use PKPD simulation to understand the clinical relevance of these models, the fact that we use simulation to, to draw clinical inference, I think is another really important idea uh, that should be dear to the heart of ISAP members. And then, uh, of course, the advent of propofol. So we're sort of moving into the pharmaceutic advances. The uh, revolutionary advances in propofol formulation spearheaded by, by Dr. Ian Glenn, by John Glenn, uh, really had a huge impact in the world, right? And that's why he got the Lasker Prize, um, because he had such a, a visionary uh, thinking about how we could actually get propofol into the clinic. And boy, hasn't that made an incredible impact. In the, in the operating room and in the ICU. Oh, I'm sorry. And the idea of soft drugs, which is also another idea that's, that, that this group is quite fond of, that is drugs that are, uh, that sort of fall apart. That is that are uh, very rapidly metabolized. Remifentanil is the chief example. Remazolam seems to be another uh, example. And then there are many other examples that, that uh, various investigators in this room have been fiddling with, uh, including Dr. Raines, for example. And so this is another big advance. Gizmos and gadgets in, in uh, anesthesia, the process EEG, various display and simulation systems, carbon controlled infusions, these are also have been really, really important. And this deserves an individual mention Enabling practice in the concentration domain for intravenous anesthetics, big advance, really, really cool. Okay, enter the titration paradox. This is the brainchild of Dr. Thomas Schneider uh, and some of his colleagues. I, I've had the pleasure of, of contributing just a, a wee little bit. And uh, I'm gonna be very interested to get uh, Dr. Schneider's reaction as to how I'm sort of thinking about the titration paradox. This was a new concept in anesthesia clinical pharmacology. And interestingly, it was published in the Journal of Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, not where we might have expected it to show up. So why is that? Well, Thomas can answer that question. And, and it may be that I had a suggestion about that. But what we want to really examine today is if we look at all these interesting advances, and I'm sure you might have included some others, what are we going to think about this titration paradox? Is it going to be another big sort of advance? And I think the answer is probably yes. It's going to have some interesting rippling effects in our specialty. So if we think about the uh, anesthesia library and all the knowledge that has been accumulated in the modern era, we can be proud that ISAP represents sort of a cornerstone because clinical pharmacology is so important in anesthesia. And I want to just give a shout out to all the people in this room. We are a small society. This is a boutique society, but we punch above our weight. These are influential people in this room that have made huge contributions that have altered practice around the world. So we can be very proud of that, even though we don't have a thousand uh, members of our society.
So the, the drug titration paradox is sort of a new brick in this clinical pharmacology foundation. And it's going to be interesting to consider uh, how it impacts things. OK, jumping on to the next topic, I want to talk just for a minute about titration because we got to understand what we mean by titration if we're going to discuss the titration paradox. So for anesthetics, titration is the primary approach to getting the dose right. Now, I'm very fond, as some of you know, of the term postology. <laughs> and nobody else seems to ever utter this word. And so I don't know why that is, but I'm going to keep trying to popularize this term. So this is my, this is one of my last tries. This was uh, an editorial that appeared in the BJA about five years ago. And, and uh, it, it, it introduces the idea that posology is essentially dosology. And dosology is really important to us. We have a specialty where you have to get the dose right. And there's not a lot of room for, uh, for getting it wrong without serious consequences. Okay, so let's think about uh, anesthesia pulsology through a Venn diagram. So here we're thinking about the dose domain. And in most areas of therapeutics, there's a big overlap between the effective dose and the safe dose. And we, we refer to that, of course, as a high therapeutic index. Anesthesiology is very different. So we have very little overlap between the safe and effective doses. Try putting your sevaflowane vaporizer on 4% for very long and see what happens, right? And so we have low therapeutic index drugs, but that's not all. We also have this challenge of efficiency. We produce these profound effects. People are unconscious. They're not reacting to pain with movement or, or uh, their autonomic system. They're typically not breathing. They uh, have a depressed circulation and so on and so forth. Profound effects, more profound than most specialties. And yet, five plus minutes after the surgeries are done, we gotta reverse all that, take it all back. That's a fundamental challenge in anesthesia and that's part of why dos dosology or postology is so important for us. So the anesthesia pulsology is really optimized at the nexus of safe, effective, and efficient dosing. Now, this is just a little schematic uh, that sort of tries to, to convey uh, in, a, in an illustration how we dose. So we start with the Bayesian prior, what's in the textbooks, what's in the, in the literature. And we have a sense of, okay, whether we're practicing in the dose concentration or effect domain, we have a sense of what we should be shooting for. And then based on some electronic feedback from various monitors, it might be the standard physiologic monitor, it might be a PK simulation, it might be a, a process EEG signal, and also the clinical feedback we observe from the patient, we make adjustments. So the physician closes the loop. This is open loop control. Now, if we recognize that that's where anesthesia Postology is optimized, we can think of ourselves as titration experts. And this is a concept that we talk a lot about in anesthesia. We introduce anesthesia trainees to this idea right from the beginning, right? That we're trying to get it just drop by drop, trying to get it right. I want to quickly mention that target controlled infusion systems really are the ultimate titration system or intravenous drug administration. And it's the sort of the same concept, but more sophisticated. One way to look at a target controlled infusion system is to think of it as a game strip. We know that, the, that we don't hit the targets perfectly. They're probably within plus or minus 20 some odd percent. So it's not perfect. And it's not as good as a vaporizer because it's a model, it's not physics, right? But uh, it, is a, it is a game switch and it's very good at achieving a steady state. We know that's true. And so you can sort of dial this up and down and consider uh, TCI is really the ultimate uh, method of titration for intravenous anesthetics. So we don't think of ourselves as chemists in the operating room, but, but we are. Because for titration in the operating room, the, the anesthesiology is the chemist and the pumps and vaporizers are the burees and the patient is this flask. And we're trying to get just enough into that flask to make it work. 
and to optimize our goals of the anesthetic. Okay, so now we get to the meat of the question or of the presentation. The drug titration paradox is a new concept in anesthesia clinical pharmacology. It may be new to some of you in this room because it is really new. I mean, it's only been around for a year or so. And, and so it's just emerging. And it takes a while for this stuff to sort of disseminate, even among the academic types. So this is the original paper. It appeared in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics. And it starts with, we observed paradoxically that greater effect was associated with lesser dose. Wow, that's interesting. How could that be? That, that just doesn't make sense, does it? Could less be more? Is that possible? Well, there was a accompanying editorial by Drs. Schaefer and Skansky, who were the mentors of the, uh, of the group publishing the paper led by Dr. Schneider. And here's the quote from the early part of this editorial. It seems impossible. How could more propofol or more sevoflurane result in less anesthesia? It makes no sense. But in their large data set, the exposure response relationship is turned upside down. So that's reflected, that oxymoron is reflected in the title. So some of you may know that Dr. Schneider recently bought a new house. He recently, <laughs> built, he recently built a new house, and he's so proud of this concept, this is it. In fact, I've shown you that it, you know, there's the house Schneider uh, above, the, above the front door. I haven't seen your new house yet, Thomas, but I, I can't wait to see it. I'm going to be very proud if it's like this. OK, so let's talk about the origins of the idea. Where did this come from? So we collaborated some time ago to publish an exploration of the relationship between propofol drug concentrations, the bispectral index, and patient covariance. It had nothing to do with the titration paradox. It was a separate effort. But if you look at the, the key piece of raw data in this paper, it made us scratch our heads. Honestly, it made Thomas scratch his head. He began to, to sort of make the translogical leap and realize that this doesn't make a lot of sense. So here's that same raw data. So this is a heat map. This study was of almost 5,000 patients who were getting anesthetized with a general anesthetic using a Chiva technique. And this is really key to, to keep in mind because we're going to show you a lot of plots along these lines. 30 minutes after the incision, the, the propofol target effect site concentration and the BIS value were recorded. So sort of those are the T30, OK? Uh, the, the time at 30, the, the, the PD signal and the PK signal. And you can see in this heat map that it's an, it's an unexpected observation. In other words, that at higher doses of propofol, you have higher BISs. It's supposed to go in the other direction. OK, so let's define this. When a drug is titrated to a specific level of effect, getting at the definition of the concept now, the expected positive correlation between dose and effect is reversed. So in the original paper, I thought this was masterfully done, by the way. Um, I should disclose, because this is another part of my disclosure, Thomas is one of my really good friends. And so I'm, I'm naturally inclined to be complimentary. But I, I want you to know that I'm being very genuine about that. Uh, they did a beautiful job explaining the concept using some nicely done graphics. OK, so let's walk through this. If you give the same dose to everyone, as, as reflected on this left graph, the typical patient, which is most patients, are going to have the effect that you're targeting. Keep in mind that what, through all of this, we're targeting this half of maximal effect. Just, it was just arbitrarily chosen, right? Uh, but it's, it's a nice way to, to, uh, to graph it out. So most patients have the expected result. But the problem is that there are some patients that are sensitive, and they have a much higher level of effect. And then there's some patients that are resistant, and they have a much lower level of effect. And you're going to see we're going to draw in this color scheme as we go along. Now, that means that you've got to do some titration in much of the population. So you don't have to do anything with the people who have the desired response, the typical patient. But 
the sensitive patient, you've got to titrate it down. And the resistant patient, you've got to titrate them up, right? Everything, everything straightforward so far. Now, interestingly, once you get perfect titration, everybody has the same effect. And there's no correlation between the PD signal and the dose, right? And of course, this could be either dose or concentration. But that's an important point. When you have perfect titration, there's no correlation. So let's now look at let's now look at what we see when you titrate. When you titrate, you're going to have an average sort of response for the sensitive people, shown in red, and you're going to have an, a, a sort of a typical average response, a central tendency of the data for the resistant patient. And if you we're showing the same graph that we were just looking at on the left here. If you take away sort of the, the concentration effect relationships reflecting sensitive and resistant, and just look at the way this data would appear to the data analyst doing the analysis, you'd see that the paradox emerges, right? That higher doses are associated with lower effect. And this is a, this is a function of the titration. Now, here's another little drawing. This is the drawing from the editorial. I think this is uh, interesting to consider. We give hints of this in our practice, right, in the individual patient. So we all have patients where we're, we're titrating, either titrating the vaporizer or uh, the TCI system or the infusion pump. And we think, wow, this is kind of weird because I got really low doses here, low doses, but, uh, I got excessive effect. This patient's unusual. This patient is especially sensitive to these drugs. And of course, the converse can also be true. So we do see this. We get some hint of it in the trenches of daily practice. Now, just a quick word about the, the titration paradox and variability. The titration paradox really teaches us a lot about variability because it's a function of variability. We this phenomenon arises because one size does not fit all. I like to call this anesthesia's Procrustean problem. Procrustes, as you may remember from your uh, undergraduate or high school studies of Greek mythology, was the sort of nasty character who would kidnap people on the road from Athens to Olympus, take him back to his hideout, and he'd put them on a bed as though they were his guests in the guest room. But if their legs were too long, he chopped them off. And if his legs, if their legs were too short, he had a, a stretching device to get them to fit. So this is a Procrustean problem. One size does not fit all. And so when we apply a typical dose to a big population, we're always going to see some sensitive population, subpopulation, and some resistant subpopulation. And the paradox emerges from this reality. Okay. So let's look at the lines of evidence that support this idea. There are three of them so far. So first in the raw data, and this is from the original description in the Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics paper. And again, here we're looking at propofol, sevoflurane, and norepinephrine. Propofol and norepinephrine administered in the concentration domain, sevoflurane also, but with a, with a vaporizer as opposed to a TCI system. So we've got the 30 minutes after incision, we take the PD signal, they took the PD signal and the PK signal and looked at the relationship. And look, an unexpected relationship. Remember, on this particular graph, uh, less effect is, is up higher, right? And so this was a, a, an unexpected finding. Same thing with sevoflurane, unexpected concentration effect relationship. Higher doses, higher bed. Doesn't make sense. And of course, the opposite is true for norepinephrine. Again, an unexpected concentration effect relationship. Higher concentration and higher blood pressure, right? So strange, strange uh, observation that, that got Thomas thinking. Now, I, I just want to point out, if you look at this left graph and you say, well, I'm not so sure. That looks like a scatter plot to me. And there certainly is some, some element of that. You can look at the raw data in another way. So this is plotting the, the concentration at just 30 minutes after incision 
versus the fraction of the target concentration. So we're showing it a cumulative distribution of TCI targets of 1,000 subjects with the greatest effect at, at, at 30 minutes. And here we're showing the cumulative distribution of TCI targets of the 1,000 subjects that had the least effect at 30 minutes. And you can see there's very clear separation that the, the people with the greatest effect had a lower uh, concentration, uh, central tendency, and just the opposite was true for the people with the least effect. So I see this as a very nice way of, of dispelling the, the scatter plot concern that I just mentioned. Okay, they also demonstrated this with Monte Carlo simulations. So on the left, and by the way, these simulations were 5,000 subjects for each simulation. Again, targeting half of maximal effect uh, as part of the approach in the simulation. So on the left here, we have a random dose that's distributed with some noise around the population D50. The dose that, that for the population should get you half of maximal effect. And the normal concentration effect relationship comes through. So hooray, this is what we expect, right? But if you personalize the dose and you calibrate the dose to the individual's D50 with some noise around it, you can see that that correlation essentially disappears. That is that in, in, this, in, this, in this simulation, you can see that there's essentially no correlation between the dose or concentration and the level of effect. Okay, so they developed a sort of a, a neural network, maybe that's not the right term, but they developed an algorithm for titration as part of the simulation. So this is a, a, a now a different simulation where they're showing the first identical dose to the whole population with a distribution of sensitivity uh, and resistance. And you can see that if you've got, as you expect, if you've got resistant patients and sensitive patients, that you're going to see this negative correlation that we're talking about. And then if you titrate five steps, according to the algorithm they developed for the simulation purposes, you can, you can see that this, this negative correlation uh, persists, right? And this box is just meant to show, and this is just a quick nuance, that the paradox is greater, as you might expect, when there's wider latitude for the effect target and when there's a narrower, narrower acceptable dose range. Okay, so more evidence, second line of evidence in the Monte Carlo simulation. Now, just briefly I want to say, they also did uh, a mathematical proof using deductive logic, and I'm not qualified to critique uh, the, the proof. Uh, perhaps, perhaps Dr. Weber is uh, among our audience and, and, and some others. But to, to quote from the article, by deduction we proved that the average dose effect relationship during titration to the target effect will associate lower doses with greater effect. That looks a little bit like Steve Schaefer, don't you think? Um, and as I understand it, so I guess what I'm telling you here is that let's just accept that the proof uh, passed peer review and that it's, uh, it's robust. Uh, as I understand it, this is a picture of Steve uh, with some of his, uh, for people who know him well, some of his scribbling uh, uh, sort of collaborating on the, on the proof. This was kindly supplied by Thomas. Okay, so a brief word about individual data. Don't you expect that this titration paradox should not be apparent in individual data? That's what we that's what we sort of expect, right? But in fact, and I had the, the privilege of collaborating on this one, in fact, we identified the titration paradox in individual data, and it suggests that changing levels of surgical stimulation were the confounding variable that made the titration paradox emerge. Let me show you what this data looks like. I realize that you can't see this well, but follow me and I think uh, you'll get it. So this was a, a, a sort of a post hoc analysis of previously collected data. It was a publication actually by a guy that did a fellowship with us uh, at the University of Utah. He's one of the contributors of closed loop alfentanil to control uh, mean arterial blood pressure in the context of a, of a general anesthetic. 11 patients testing this control system. The raw data uh, shows the, the paradox in, I'm just gonna blow this up so you can see it. So this is all patients and the paradox seems to be there. So this is aggregate data of the whole population. And again, this is in the context of titration. So 
the point we're, we're sort of developing here is that we expect that. But what about the individuals? This is what's crazy. So we have all in 11 individuals represented here. And the titration paradox was apparent in, in almost all of them. Now, how could that be? Well, we postulated that, that the confounding variable was the level of surgical stimulation. And that will become apparent when we talk about the application of Simpson's paradox to this idea. All right. So they ultimately, uh, we ultimately concluded that in routine care, where the effect is profoundly influenced by clinical, by varying clinical conditions, that, that dr and, dug, and drugs are titrated to achieve the effect, wouldn't happen if you just had random dosing. It's got to be titration. It's nearly impossible to draw meaningful conclusions about the relationship between dose and effect. And that is sort of the take-home uh, point as it relates to the, to the research implications of the titration paradox. It's really, really hard to, to make conclusions about the concentration effect relationship when titration is used. Okay, a brief word about the drug titration paradox as a form of Simpson's paradox. Uh, I have to be honest, I had never really explored the Simpson's paradox idea, although I heard Nathan Pace, one of my colleagues, talk about it once in a while. But it has nothing to do with the, with the Simpson family. Uh, it's named after the statistician who conceived of it. Emery Brown, one of our uh, colleagues who uh, has occasionally been a speaker at this meeting, wrote an editorial with the original publication in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics pointing out that, hey, the titration paradox is a form of Simpson's paradox. Now, let's explore that a little bit because this really helped me grasp this quite a bit, recognizing that this is Simpson's paradox. Okay, so what is Simpson's paradox? It's a trend or result that is present in the aggregate data that flips around in the individual data when you consider it in subgroups, okay? It's often counterintuitive. It's a conditional probability issue. So the statisticians will say, oh, this is kind of expected if there's a conditional probability or a confounding variable that we're not seeing. It, it requires context to understand it. And again, it can be explained by the confounding influence. Okay, so uh, I created this little GIF to illustrate. So we have two variables, and when you put them all together in the black dots, it looks like the correlation is negative. But when you look at the subpopulations, it looks like all of those are positive. Isn't that interesting? Let's give a real world example of how this could possibly happen. I'm taking the same docs, by the way. So I realize this isn't quite realistic because there, there would be more overlap in height if we were to uh, actually study this. But you'll get the idea. So this is plotting height versus blocked shot. Now, I know many of you are Europeans, and maybe you don't really like basketball, but uh, a blocked shot is when the defender is able to stop by, by jamming the ball, is able to stop the shooter from shooting. So the, the, the shot is rejected. OK, so is it possible that the, the, uh, this relationship is negative? Is that possible? Is it really possible that the taller you get, the fewer block shots you have? There's no way that anyone would accept that. Well, there's a confounding variable. And what is that confounding variable? In this case, we could postulate that it's age, OK? If you look at these subgroups, we could accept the idea that a 50-year-old is not going to get as many block shots as the teenager or the 20-year-old, right? And so this is what Simpson's paradox is. When you analyze the subgroups, the relationship flips because you reveal a confounding variable. Okay, so uh, we're, we're on the home stretch now. This is a, a part of the figure that came from the Emory Brown editorial. He points out that a common goal of clinical pharmacology studies, of course, is to establish the dose response relationship. And on the left, we have model A, which is a titration model. And on the right, we have a randomized or a fixed dose. 
different model in the study design. Now, what this little triangle is showing you, this is a causal diagram. What this is showing is that if you have an unobserved confounding variable, you might get it wrong. Whereas if you use randomized or fixed doses, you can uh, get rid of that confounding variable and have a better chance at truly understanding the real uh, concentration effect relationship. Now, this is, of course, oversimplified, but you get the idea. So Marge Simpson was smarter than we give her credit for. Okay, so just to wrap up, the drug titration paradox has important implications for anesthesiology research. Honestly, I'm not exactly sure what they are, um, but, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to be important. So let's, let's talk about that, and I'll be interested. I know that we're, we're running late, but I'm trying to catch up a little bit. But let's consider this together because we have a lot of smart people here, and I'm very interested in your reaction. And I'm also getting prepared for some serious pushback from my friend Thomas, but we'll see. Okay, so the drug titration paradox and research implications. Well, in the individual clinical patient, this is a really important point. It doesn't matter, right? Because we can handle that. In the individual patient, no problem. We got a sensitive patient, we can adapt to that. We have a resistant patient, we can adapt to that. So it's not really a big deal in the individual patient. But uh, in, in research studies in a population of patients where titration is used, it can be a problem. This was an example, Steve Schaefer and I were talking about this quite a bit. I wanted to get his thinking. And uh, he pointed out a, a really thought-provoking idea. Well, Thomas, let's suppose that you know one of your sons, I don't have any sons in a high school anymore, but they, they certainly could have done this experiment. Let's suppose that one of your sons goes to, uh, gets permission to go to an ICU, maybe because maybe because mom is an ICU nurse or an ICU doctor, and they get permission to gain access to the ICU, and they just go around and they just record for a, a week or so what's the, what's the dose of epinephrine and what's the blood pressure. What do you think they'd find? They'd see the titration paradox, right? They would conclude that epinephrine lowers blood pressure. And we know that's not true. But it's a function of the variability in the population and the titration paradox. So that's a great example to explain this to, uh, to your colleagues as you try to uh, spread the, the word. OK, so what's the crux of the matter? In the conventional clinical pharmacology experiment, drug exposure is supposed to be the independent variable. It's what we're supposed to be able to control so we can see how it influences the dependent variable. But when drugs are titrated, the drug effect becomes the independent variable. That's the key point. OK, so here's a conventional clinical pharmacology experiment. We have a dose as the independent variable, and we have effect as the dependent variable. When you titrate, this gets flipped. And suddenly, effect is the independent variable, and the dose is the dependent variable. That really messes us up when we're trying to understand the concentration effect relationship. I'm going to take you through one example. And again, I know we're, uh, I promise I'm not taking longer than I was allotted. Um, I want to talk about a tale of two trials, because this is quite interesting. And I don't really know exactly how to interpret this, but it's very thought-provoking. OK, I think many of you are familiar with these trials. These would be interesting to ISAP members. There's the ENGAGES trial and the, the BALANCED trial. <laughs> they were looking at the uh, influence of anesthetic exposure and delirium, right? And really, the, the, the technique was, can we use the process EEG to reduce the incidence of delirium? Well. The ENGAGES trial concluded no. And the BALANCE trial concluded yes. And you know what? These were good trials. These were smart people doing careful work. Is it possible that the titration paradox is part of the explanation? Well, let's look at some of the correspondence. Because when you have big expensive trials, big RCTs that have uh, diametrically opposed views, that really bugs us, right? Because we start to think, well, we can't, we can't get the answer right, despite all this effort. So 
here's some correspondence from the Engage's authors. We posit that the subpopulation-based differences in this multi-center study could have affected the delirium outcome or occurrence since the findings appear to be uh, due to uh, the, the center sites that were in East Asia. Okay, that's a reasonable thing, and that could certainly be true. Then uh, Jamie Slay, uh, a person that's been uh, mentioned uh, down the hall quite a bit today at the MPOG meeting, they pointed out that you can make a strong argument. They didn't realize they were getting at the drug titration paradox, but, uh, but they were. They said, we can make a strong argument for randomization to anesthetic dose rather than EEG targets to better understand the drug exposure outcome relationship, because then you get rid of the confounding variable. And they proposed these causal diagrams, which many of you may use in, in designing your trials. They pointed out that the ENGAGES trial, well, that, that I'm sorry, that both of these trials used uh, uh, a, a design that allowed the intraoperative EEG to feedback to the dose, such that we can found a drug exposure with the outcome. And they suggested that, well, an alternative design would be to randomize. And, and that way, you get a simpler cause and effect relationship, a simpler causal diagram. And you eliminate at least this possibility for the Simpsons paradox that is the drug titration paradox. Now, uh, enter Schneider and Minto. They point out that Whitlock and colleagues base some of their arguments on the assumption that lower BIS is related to higher dose, which ignores the titration paradox. So they propose an alternative explanation that maybe the drug dose was the independent variable. Maybe this was an example of the titration paradox. And they took some, this is really interesting. They took some data in the supplemental files published with the paper, and uh, they showed that the, the group publishing the study assumed that the higher doses were associated with lower BIS. And that's the way, so they took the, the, the upper and the lower quartiles, and they assumed that the concentration effect relationship was that in, in that direction. Whereas, so that's what you have here on the left. Whereas Thomas and Charles Schneider and Minto said, well, actually, it might be, it might be this. It might be that the titration paradox is at play, and this flips. Uh, at least it influences how you're going to interpret your results. So this is where this is where I got invited to write an editorial, and I must tell you, I was quite bewildered by this whole thing, because uh, because it, it was just an odd sort of way of having an editorial appear in our literature. And I simply point out that the the titration paradox has potentially important implications in anesthesia research, especially when you're, tr when you're titrating and you're trying to draw some conclusions about the concentration effect relationship or drug exposure and an outcome. So get this, this was an editorial about a letter, about an editorial, about an RCT. So that was kind of weird. Okay, so here we go to wrap up. Take home points uh, as it relates to the research implications. For trials seeking to establish an association between drug exposure and outcome, we need to recognize that establishing this exposure outcome relationship is challenging when titration is, is employed. We need, to, we need to ask investigators that if they're using titration as part of their design, they ought to be thinking about confounding variables. And at the very least, they ought to uh, show us a, a, the raw data so that we can see whether the titration paradox emerges. If it doesn't emerge, you could conclude that the titration wasn't done properly, right? Because it should be there. It's an expected finding. We need to consider randomization of dose instead of titration. That might be very difficult in certain trials. And of course, if titration is, is what's, at, what's, what's being investigated, there's no, there's no way around it. You have to titrate. Consider causal diagrams to assist in design so you can be thinking about confounding variables and the Simpson paradox aspect. Um, I think this is the biggie. You gotta really beware of the drug titration paradox in retrospective big data studies. 
because that paradox is very likely to be apparent, and it may change the conclusion. And this means that we may need to reexamine some very important influential trials in the literature. I don't know whether that's true. Let me just be clear about that. I don't know whether that's true, but it certainly seems feasible. So the Patriarch and Paradox has turned the world upside down. I tried to get a picture of Thomas on his head, but I didn't, didn't find one. So thank you very much.